Good morning, everyone. We're very excited once again to be with you. Um, it's day two of our married uh, webinar. Our theme is Marriages Succeeding in Crisis. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, once again, we have Pastor Lincoln and his wife, Pastor Grace, and they, they're joining us from the UK. As I mentioned yesterday, they have uh, over 35 years experience in counseling couples, uh, both married and intending, as well as general relationship counseling. Many of you know them from CLA. Um, Pastor Lincoln has been involved in the men's ministry and he has also preached at CLA uh, uh, several times now. Um, you may not have been with us yesterday, but the session was really, really encouraging and inspiring. Um, and I think one of the things that stood out was that marriage fundamentally um, was created by God um, for us. It's a good idea and it's a good thing. God does not create things that are not good and it is up to us to walk in his will and vision, um, in companionship, and in fulfilling uh, what it is that we were put on earth to do together. And I would say, as we prepare to start, please, uh, just one last time, send reminders to all your WhatsApp uh, contacts and ask everyone to log in, because um, I think this is going to be a very powerful session. And so do one last reminder for to people, remind them to join. And I'm sure that we're going to leave this morning session with our marriages fortified. Um, we will be taking questions uh, at the end of, of this session. So use the YouTube chat window to post questions. And uh, I think that will be the prime, the primary way we will be doing this. Uh, if you would not want to type on the YouTube ch uh, chat window, you can inbox any of the pastors and they will, they will forward that to the marriage ministry team. And I think without further ado, I'm going to just open in prayer and then we will hear from Pastor Lincoln and Pastor Grace. All right. Father, we thank you so much for yet another beautiful day, a beautiful morning. We're so thankful to be alive. It is a gift that we can breathe and that we can uh, sit and reflect together as couples across this city. And in fact, we know that people are joining us from different countries. And so we're thankful that we get to, to grow in fellowship with one another we're thankful that we get to learn and we're incredibly thankful that we have uh, Pastor Lincoln and Pastor Grace sharing from their lives, sharing from their experience and, and pouring into our lives. Your word says that he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And we pray that as they pour into our lives, that you would refresh them, you would pour into their lives that as they give, it will given, be given back unto them um, so many times fold. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your, for your blessings. I pray that you speak through them and that in a special way, each one of us would live with something that will transform our marriages and thereby transform our families. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You want us to take it away, Alpha? <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> well, it's so great to be back. Uh, greetings to you all, wherever you're logging in from. We are welcoming you to our lounge, and I hope we are loud and clear. Uh, we just thought we'll just be very natural here and just uh, conversationally engage with yourselves. Um, um, some of you may be meeting my wife for the first time. I've spoken about her a lot in my visits to, to Chigali. She's a daughter of Rwanda. So I'll give her a moment to say hi. 
Hi. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> yeah, hi everybody. Um, we kind of met, for those of you that were tuned in yesterday, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I'm Mrs. Saranga, originally from Rwanda, I would say, um, but born and bred in Uganda and lived in the UK for however many years. So wherever yeah. you want to place me, I think <laughs> I can kind of fit pretty much everywhere. Yeah, Grace is a, is a lawyer. Uh, she's a solicitor here and um, uh, a co-pastor alongside me. We've been married for 31 years, going 32 in March. And so we want to just bring you into our home, into our marriage and, and share uh, from our hearts. Last night, we started the journey with the understanding that marriage is not a human idea. It was not something we conjured up because of our desperate need for sexual uh, gratification or financial strategy or social, you know, uh, status. It was God's idea. And I made the point towards the end that I believe uh, human marriage is an extension of a divine principle because God himself dwells in triune oneness, Father, Son, and Spirit in complete communion. And he has extended that into the earth, not in a triune way, but in, in couples, men and women. Come in, the Bible says that two shall become one flesh. Mm. And so uh, his vision and desire is that uh, our homes, our marriages become a, a small microcosmic uh, portrayal of that oneness in the Trinity where there is passion for each other, oneness of mind, oneness of spirit. And uh, we, we recognize that the context of this con conference now is, um, is really the crisis that is hitting the nations. And uh, there's been dire statistics as marriages are folded up alongside businesses and global economies. Uh, couples have found it difficult to live together. And uh, there's been uh, queues forming at, at um, divorce courts as husband and wife who have been tottering on the edge have been pushed over through the pressures of, of being in one space under lockdown, mm -hmm. homeschooling, businesses closing down, uh, social immobility, and, and all kinds of difficulties have tipped the balance for homes. Uh, but at the heart of, of, of my belief, our belief as a couple is at the base of all marriage problems is our discipleship problems. Really, there is nothing really as a marriage problem in and of itself. Marriage has become the billboard on which our discipleship needs are, are, are broadcasted or projected. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the real desperate need is when we are not growing as believers, our relationships will suffer. And the, the issue of crisis uh, to me, take, took me straight away to uh, thoughts of the, the six stages of marriage that um, people talk about. Uh, passion stage is the first one. When uh, I first saw this girl on the steps of uh, St. Francis Chapel and then the friendship that developed out of that. And finally, the moment when I asked her to, to, to be a friend closer than anyone could be, that the whole thing is passion. It's caught up in passion and there is so much excitement and you talk about falling in love. And then uh, that is passion stage. And then stage two, as you remember, is the realization stage where you begin as you engage to realize much as you're crazy about each other, there are real issues emerging, mm -hmm. issues of difference, as uh, value differences, uh, preferences, different conflict styles, and all these kinds of issues begin to hit on the marriage and now the journey has begun. So there's the wake up, there's a wake up stage, which is stage two, called the realization stage. And as negotiations begin, <laughs> and uh, my, my wife will tell you how the negotiations go. Uh, from courtship, the negotiations begin for territory, for space, and you suddenly realize all oh, my days, uh, the things that I thought were under the belt are, are real challenges. And, and you begin it's to- It's called heated fellowship. <laughs> <laughs> heated fellowship, exchanges, and, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, there, it starts with, with this sense of disbelief and, 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 and um, um, bewilderment as you 
begin to realize this is not going to be easy. And the challenge is uh, uh, every couple needs to find out who they are. There are no two similar couples in the earth. Mm -hmm. And I think in the first formative years of a couple walking together, you need to find out who are we? What are we like? What is our profile like? How do we connect? How do we conflict? How do we resolve conflict? And you need to literally invest uh, like a nation does in an infrastructure of roads and electricity and water pipes. And so you, you set, you need to put an infrastructure in place as a couple so that you can uh, build on that moving forward. Now that is where things go wrong. And uh, in times of, um, uh, of crisis, uh, the infrastructural problems begin to hit us. And uh, so we end up in stage three, which is called the rebellion stage. Yeah. <laughs> rebellion is when you say, that's it. I can't do this. I, I'm not going to negotiate anymore. I'm going to have it my way. It's either my way or the highway, that kind of stuff. So uh, stage three, things can escalate and couples can become completely overwhelmed by a sense of every time they are trying to engage, things are backfiring and people go into rebellion mode where uh, this is how you found me. I'm not going to change for you. Da, 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 da. People begin to now consolidate the areas where they failed, where they feel negotiations have failed. Now, some, some couples actually give up uh, at realization stage. <laughs> I said, oh, my days, I made a mistake. She's not perfect or he's not perfect. So people bail out of courtships. Some people bail out of courtships. And uh, the danger of overextended courtships, for those of you that are in courtship, is you can begin to get into stages of marriage when you are still in courtship because you've protracted it out too long. You've over, you out outlasted the passion stage. You've gone into realization stage. And now you're in rebellion stage and you're fighting as a courting couple. So I personally don't advise that uh, uh, courtship should be extra, extra stretched out. How long was that? Ooh, three years. Three years. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, partly uh, the challenge is, of course, when you're a very young couple and you're trying to, to set up home and uh, we had to emigrate to the UK. But we made a decision at some point, we, we're just going to do this. The money wasn't there, but we just had to do it. And so we encourage uh, and there's been advantages in the lockdown that couples that have been protracting this have decided now that there's lockdown and we can't gather too many people, let's do, do a, let's just go and do a short, sharp wedding scenario with fewer people and get this thing done. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> but like I was saying, the point is you move into rebellion stage and rebellion is about I am who I am, get over it. I'm not going to change. And it begins to become a dangerous situation, and that can become uh, a, a death trap for some relationships. And then uh, uh, from that, uh, the ad advice is you could go into crisis after that, after rebellion. Uh, crisis, but the crisis stage can hit on any, at any time. But typically after rebellion, if you don't deal with rebellion issues, you're gonna end up in the crisis stage of the relationship where everything becomes topsy-turvy. Now, a uh, crisis can come much earlier, as I said, uh, as I especially say, but now for the whole world, there's been this huge baptism in, of, of fire <laughs> by the coronavirus locking us in. And I can tell you every marriage has had to, to check its, its quality and tested us, you know, we've gone through some testings and, and our seams have been checked. And it's a time to upgrade and take charge of things. Now, but if you survive these kind of things or if you plan through them well, you come to uh, what they call cooperation. Cooperation, we agree to find a way. Mm. Uh, and uh, successful couples are actually not trouble free. They just manage their problems well. And I'm coming back to that That's in a important. moment. And we, we need to understand, friends, that it's never about being perfect, but more about understanding that every situation needs to be managed. You need to think through stuff and work through stuff. So cooperation stage, then arguably there's a reunion stage where you rediscover 
and, and can re-engage at a much deeper way. And, and some even add finally a completion stage. By completion stage, you're nice and gray. I start a sentence, you finish it. <laughs> you know, I know exactly what you're about to say. I can read your mind. And I knew exactly what color top you're gonna wear. So it was by total supernatural coincidence. <laughs> no, 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 we agreed really on this one. So much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but guys, there are stages to marriage, but today we're dealing mainly with crisis. And the reality that uh, uh, the whole world has been plunged into intense review. And I hear, arguably in Chigali, it's been up to almost 60% uh, in some areas of couples just folding up and saying, I can't do this. But it's because of the external pressures that came. So please understand, as we said yesterday, that at the heart of our journey as believers is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who loved us and died for us. We, of all uh, couples, uh, need to, to look for his word, his will, his presence mm. to dominate the marriage discussion for us as couples. <clears throat> I dare say any attempt for, by a believer to pursue a healthy marriage separate from Christ is virtually idolatrous. If I seek to enjoy a marriage whose um, <clears throat> level of intimacy and beauty and joy is not also reflected in my walk with Christ, it would, it would be like, um, <clears throat> do excuse me, it would be like I'm building the Tower of Babel. I'm trying to establish a, a victory and a dominion separate from Christ. But as a believer, <laughs> rather, we seek to build on the foundation of the word of God, which is where we were yesterday. So today I wanted us to zoom in more specifically into the whole area of conflict and conflict management, uh, but more specifically looking at the dangers <clears throat> that uh, typically pursue. Yeah, we share all things. <laughs> Friends, I want to, to, to bring out a fourfold um, uh, uh, watch. Uh, we need to watch out for four things that are a sign that perhaps what we, we were supposed to manage, we are not managing. And then the curve begins to go down and the spiral begins to go down away from the passion stage, as we said, and then the, uh, the realization stage. Uh, when we, we hit rebellion, uh, that is the boiling point. That is the curve. That's the determinant Point. And I remember my journey and with my wife, we've had our moments, we've had our times. So we don't sit in front of you to pretend that it's been a, a, a bed of roses. Well, but they say bed of roses also has a stone. But they've got thorns, yeah. <laughs> I've never understood that, but yeah. Yeah, I guess they're talking about the thorn-free variety. Right. <laughs> so a bouquet of roses. <laughs> yeah, it hasn't been perfect, but thank God. Because both of us passionately have a desire to follow Jesus. If you took him out of our chemistry, I don't think we'll be sitting in front of you. His lordship, his governance, his word, our passion for him has been the glue that has bound us together. He has been the balm that has healed us when we've been hurting Christ at the center. Mm. And so friends, uh, I want to recommend to you a, 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 a structure here. There are four uh, this guy called John Gottman, John Gottman uh, pr proposes that you look out for the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, that's a, a term used in, in Revelation 6 of the four horses that typify the end times. But if they are galloping into your marriage, you need to sit up and fight. Uh, they are normally experiences that can come and go in a healthy marriage. But when they take over and they begin to drive the marriage, you need to understand that you are hurtling towards a crisis. And so we want to touch those. Number one, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Number one is, uh, is conflict. Conflict, mm -hmm. criticism, complaining. They are all C's. Conflict, criticisms, and complaining. Now these things can happen as events, but they can become a culture. 
And when your relationship becomes uh, culturized by conflict, uh, complaining and criticisms, you are in a, a, a downward spiral. You need to rise up. And at the moment, I don't know how many couples are watching, but one of the signs that you need to sit up and take notice this, these three areas, whining, complaining, criticism, and, uh, and, and conflict, these must be managed and not be allowed to take over the ground. Now, it's been found, as I said earlier, that uh, even healthy, successful couples do have conflict. It actually is not even about how frequently or how passionate these conflicts may get. It's just that great couples resolve them and move past them in healthy ways. Of course, there are less, less healthy ways to deal with conflict when you sweep things under the carpet or you, you conflict wrong, you turn the conflict into such a bad thing. Conflict is actually arguably a necessary uh, part of a, of a thriving relationship. Mm. You imagine a couple that never mm. engage and never disagree. Yeah, yes, yeah, absolutely, yes. It's like you're dead. You yeah. Know? No, I think that um, one of the healthy signs of being alive is that you've got differences mm. in opinion. Mm. Mm. And um, I think that I came to marriage a bit naive uh, thinking that it would be, we would think exactly the same, <laughs> like we would have the same view mm. on everything. Mm. But I think you just, it, five minutes into it, you, you realize that um, you've grown up thinking, thinking different ways. Mm. And, um, and, and it not, not, it's not necessarily a bad thing because mm. it just means that you have a more rounded view exactly. of yeah. things. Yeah. But it's when that that difference of opinion yeah. becomes a problem yeah. when, when it becomes yeah. it's badly handled. Yeah. yeah. And it's driven when it's driven to the ultimate. And the way, where disagreement becomes driven to the ultimate. That's where it, it becomes a problem. Uh, the reality is you never marry after your type. This is the this is the mm -hmm. paradox of life. Weirdly quiet people marry louder people. People who want to be outside marry people who want to be inside. Extroverted people marry introverted people. And it's like, Lord, it's, it's like a, an amazing paradox. But the reality, friends, is we do not marry after our type. And so conflict is inevitable, but it shouldn't be destructive. It shouldn't be uh, dangerous to us. And so uh, the issue is that conflict is a, a skill that we learn. Uh, we, as we grow up, we each adopt a conflict, a conflict style. And some people are avoiders. When there's a conflict, they will shut down and pull back and they will do anything to avoid the conflict. Some people are attackers. When um, a conflict breaks out, they will come out all guns blazing. Some people are conciliatory. Some people are uh, a little more engaging. Some more people are a little more disengaging. You need to find out what this profile is like and, and, and seek to construct it on principle so that your marriage becomes established and you know what to do. Now, there's a whole, when I'm doing uh, premarital, I take a couple through a two hour intensive, two hours of mind bending conflict analysis. <laughs> because I just say, guys, I'm gonna help you see the cornerstones of your, of your territory here. And you need to understand what you're up, up against here. And I, we understand I can't go through all these things here, which is where uh, you as a couple past this seminar are going to have to invest time in, in saying, I'm gonna look for help. Uh, but uh, the, there is so much that we need to put down. First Peter I actually wanted, if we can look at 1 Peter 3, 7, uh, the reality is, uh, by knowledge, a house is built. And by understanding its house, its rooms are filled with good things. That's another quote, verse in, in Proverbs. But we are on a construction project. Marriage is a building project. And you cannot randomly throw bricks together and hope they will stick together. You need an architectural plan. You need to know 
and handpick materials. You need to build in sequence brick upon brick. You need to lay things, stuff down. And this is the mistake we make. We think that just because we've fallen in love, which isn't the best <laughs> expression, we fall in the stuff, you can drown in it. Mm -hmm. uh, when God wants us to walk in it, walk in love. And this is more of a construction project where you intentionally build things in place so that the marriage can work. 1 Peter 3, 7, um, uh, I wanted my wife to read. Yeah, so it says, um, husbands likewise, it's been saying something before, mm -hmm. dwell with, with them, wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers Prince may not may be not hindered. Be hindered, that you, it becomes a spiritual issue. Mm. It becomes a discipleship issue as you read. It starts with husband and wives and dwelling together. Where it ends up, prayers are being hindered. God is, God is shutting the heavens because it is a spiritual issue. I cannot treat my wife any way I want, however long I want, and get away with it scot-free. It will impact my spiritual work. It will sabotage my journey. I need to, to, to speed up. I recognize that time is flying. But friends, is, the Bible says, dwell with your wife according to understanding. The, the old King James puts it even more poignantly. It says, dwell with each other according to knowledge. And I found that you cannot randomly build a marriage. <laughs> you've got to read up. You've got to study. You've got to invest. You've got to make notes. You've got to revise. It, this whole thing should be a course of study with graduation. Uh, at the end, uh, for, for you to have uh, having completed phase one, because the rest is practical. But friends, this is the point, that we need so many skills to build this thing and make it safe. Otherwise, it's a random project, usually, for most people, where feelings are allowed to override. So conflict takes over the foreground. And this is the weird thing I found about conflict, and I'm taking longer speaking about conflict because it is the deal breaker. When a couple yeah. cannot manage their conflict, it doesn't matter how great their relationship is in other areas, the conflict alone will destroy this beautiful thing. As they say, a chain is only as strong as its weakest point. Yeah. And if all the other bits are still made of steel and the middle one is made of siso, Guess where that chain will snap? It will snap at the size of ring. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to deal with this beast called conflict because uh, that is the killer. 80% of all marital problems are actually communication based. Yeah. It's as we engage, whether we're talking about money, whether we're talking about our children, whether we're talking about career or, or whether we're having enough fun or sex life, if you cannot communicate over the issue effectively and well and safely, you can set the whole place on fire and destroy a beautiful thing. And so I, I advise strongly that every couple on this call uh, intensely invests in a journey of understanding individuality, personality types, love languages, love styles. All these are profile tools that you can find conflict styles so that you, 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 you move away from guesswork and understand your own tendency so that your partner doesn't have to contend with you, persuading you about your own behavior because you, you have a sense of what happens during conflict. Knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. By knowledge, a house is built. So the first horse of the horseman of the apocalypse is conflict. How are you do, doing this thing? Are you sulking for two weeks? Are you throwing glasses and plates across <laughs> the room? Are you, are you going into the dangerous second stage? Because when conflict is mismanaged and not dealt with, you go to second stage, which is contempt. Contempt, mm -hmm. from conflict to contempt. Now, contempt is a bad, dangerous dynamic to invade the marriage. I'll, I'll, I'll read the definition. Contempt is the feeling or belief that a person or a thing is worthless. Mm -hmm. The feeling or a thing that somebody is worthless, 
worthless or beneath your consideration. And then these beneath feelings come in and this sense of, ah, give me a break. The whole thing, not, not, not as a phrase, but as a mindset, as, as a culture, where you just do not value or see the worth in your spouse and you begin to treat them with contempt. Contemptuous yeah. behavior is mean. Mean, and it moves away from dealing with an event to dealing with character. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying that was hurtful, it becomes you are a hurtful person. Yeah. It moves away from that annoyed me to you are annoying. And, and that's a problem when you begin to set upon each other and it happens subliminally in your subconscious that you stick a label on your spouse and say she is or he is and you label them and you, you pin them to an identity. And so words come in, I want to just list a few words here. Disrespect, mockery, uh, mm. to mock each other or to mock your spouse, sarcasm, ridicule, name calling, mimicry, when you mimic them and go, nye, 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 you go, you. And then you say, yeah, yeah, and you, you make, you, you literally. Yeah, I think, I think this, <laughs> a lot of this comes back to, are you, are you really following Jesus? Sure. You know, yes. like, are you a disciple? Yeah. Um, because I think for me, the understanding that conflict can be healthy. You can, you can learn how to conflict healthily. Mm -hmm. But in, in doing that, you need to set certain parameters. Mm. So when whenever we're talking with the girls um, about marriage counseling, premarital or whatever counseling, one of the things I say is that there are certain words sure. or phrases that you just should never, you, it shouldn't cross it's your mind. And one, mm. yeah, like sometimes people say things like, what sort of a man are you? I mean, oh, wow. why should that ever enter your vocabulary? Because that now you've gone past the issue. Mm -hmm. Like, do you remember sometimes you have these conflicts where yeah. at the end of the conflict, you're not sure why you, what was the no, issue? Was it, no, was it actually? Because yeah. <laughs> like, you've gone so far into this rabbit hole of conflict mm -hmm. that at the end of it, you can't actually remember what you were conflicting over, but what you do remember is that the words that have been used in the conflict. Mm. And mm. you sort of need to stop yourself, yeah. bite your tongue, yeah. and, and, and learn some of these things are just good manners. Mm. In like, please be, be courteous. <laughs> it's just courtesy, isn't yeah, it? Be courteous yeah. when, you're, when you're dealing with something. And, and, and I think that the lack of courtesy comes when, when you've gone past dealing with an issue, mm. whether the issue is whose who's bank account are we using or are, we, are mm. we investing in this thing or are we sending money to your mom or my mom? You know? <laughs> um, mm. It goes past that and, and then just becomes painful. Mm. And then, then it becomes a question of how much can I hurt the other person? Mm. They've mm. hurt me. How, How much, can what can back? I do to hurt back? Mm. Then now you've gone into another mm. area and mm. that's, that, I guess that's what you're calling contempt. Yeah, contempt, the whole sense of being set against the other. Literally, and this is a, a, a thing to attack and deal with. And I don't know, looking at yourself, whether you feel your marriage has become overrun by a spirit of contempt, where even as you're coming into the home, you're getting out of your car if you're a driver and you are getting ready, your arm, your sleeve rolling in your mind because you're about to enter the home because it's become a world war zone because contempt has taken over because conf conflict was mismanaged. But some of this is a copy and paste from our own upbringing when you've been raised in a contemptuous situation or culture at home you watch mom and dad conflict in very unhealthy ways. Uh, and then you, you, it sub subconsciously triggers, once you are in your own marriage, you will try to treat your spouse 
in, in ways that you saw uh, uh, your dad and mom treat each other. But we cannot inherit uh, the, the spirits of, um, and the culture of, of, uh, of um, parental settings that were not rooted in Christ. We are God's people. We are God's heritage. And the Bible says in, uh, I think it's Colossians 3.12, I'm trying to read here. Therefore, as the elect of God, we are God's elect. God cast his vote on us. <laughs> he, be, he bid in heaven, called it an election. And he says, I elect Lincoln. I elect grace. My money is on them. They are kingdom. They are breakthrough. I see in them the grain of greatness. So God voted for you, friends. And he says, you are holy. You are beloved and he says, put on tender masses. Put it on. Mm -hmm. Tenderness. Learning to be tender. Re and, and I'm not saying all the time you will be. There may be times when you feel I was, I was rough and I was unconsiderate. But you should be able to break and, and come back and put that right. Because your identity, according to scripture, is holiness. You are loved. And now learn to put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another. This is just discipleship. It's not marriage counseling. Mm -hmm. It's actually just discipleship. And so, friends, this is why we insist as a couple that at the root of most marital problems is a, a failure or a, 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 a refusal to follow the Lord and to give him his rightful place. And so may God touch our hearts as we come against contempt in our homes, uh, disrespect, mockery, sarcasm, ridicule, name calling, these things should not be heard under our roofs. Mm -hmm. I have never called my wife a name. She has never called me a name. It's been 31 years. In a way, I've been lucky. I won't even judge a couple here who have called each other names because it may be something you were cultured under. But name calling to me is so below us, so beneath the standard of who we are, because the Bible says, let nothing impure come out of your mouth. We are, the, the name that we call each other is awesome, mm? fearfully and wonderfully made. That is agreeing with God. And we bless our partners that way. So friends, from criticism, you will go to contempt unless you deal with it. Once you go into contempt, Things go deeper and further into defensiveness. The third horseman is defensiveness. Defensiveness is when you've come up to the end of yourself and you say, I will never be heard. I will never be understood. Mm -hmm. I'm just now going to fight for my territory. I'm going to preserve myself and protect myself against this person. It becomes this person, this woman, this man, and and. Uh, when you come to that stage, it's very dangerous. And friends, you need to understand that uh, there's a limit to how much you can help yourself by your own resources. <clears throat> a point comes when you need help from outside of yourself. And these seminars, these times that we have together as married couples are helpful uh, in that we, we are uh, putting into, in, inputting into your marriage uh, but I, I remember a time when I got out of the house is where the first three years of my marriage and I drove around like a madman. I was saying, I need a book because if I don't find a book, I'm going to go crazy. I was trying to work through certain things that I could not get my brain around. And I recognized I need resources beyond myself. And this is a passion every husband must have. This is a calling Everyone must, must consider that you need help sometimes. Uh, you just cannot do this by yourself. So the defensiveness is when it's all about survival. I've got to fight this woman. I've got to fight this man. <laughs> and, and then it becomes war in the home. Mm. And everyone is looking for the, uh, a bigger gun. But, uh, you know, friends, and, and we, we need to, to begin to wrap up, wrap up now. The, the point is this. Uh, Remember that I said that marriage is just an extension of a heavenly uh, story. God, from the moment he fell in love with us in making us in his image and likeness, has been looking for us. 
And when things went wrong in the, in the garden, God made a pact. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save you. I'm going to rescue you. Now, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22, the Bible tells me, uh, husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church. So he doesn't say, Lincoln, conjure out some kind of marriage arrangement and some love arrangement between you and Grace. He says, no, look at Jesus and do it his way because God's love for the church predates my love for grace. And I cannot sort of figure out a way of loving her on my own. I can't invent it. The Bible says there is a model for me to imitate. And that model is Christ. How did Jesus love the church? Number one, he packed his bags and migrated from heaven to earth. Mm. Yeah? And this is moving away from defensiveness. God could have gone defensive and said, shut all the doors of heaven. Make sure all these guys, rotten guys, go to hell. I don't want any of them in my world. I've sent them prophets. I've tried to engage. They won't listen. No, God said, okay, final effort. I'm going to go. I'm going to cross. I'm going to do the impossible. And these are journeys that the couple must make. But I always push it on the guys first because I'm a guy. I can only manage my territory. <laughs> but this emigration must be done. God left his world and came into my world. The, 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 that journey is infinite. And I tell you, the journey between a man and a woman, in, psychologically, the world of women and the world of men are infinitely separated. Which is why you end up with the language, oh, women are impossible. Oh, men are impossible. But God decided that impossible was not going to close the argument. So he packed his bags 2,000 years ago and he moved in. He came among us and sat with us and he put on diapers. You can't even imagine Jewish pampas in those, in those times. But uh, seriously, guy, Jesus joined our world. He crawled in the dust. He played in the fields. He ate our food. He learned our language. And God is saying this must happen for every couple. Instead of defensiveness and drawing borders and saying, this is how I'm doing it. That's how you do it. We make these impossible journeys of crossing into each other's world, learning each other's language and taking time. Can you imagine Jesus was silent for 30 years? God was silent with us for 30 years. He earned the right to speak to us because to the Jews until you're 30, you don't say nothing. And sometimes we are trying too quickly to resolve too many problems in a relationship that's supposed to last a lifetime. And we want it sorted in three years. She's the wrong one. I've, I've tested her for three years. Three years, you've tested him or her? Mm, should, should you even be testing? Really? <laughs> no, we <laughs> need the long haul. Yeah. We need to work on this. We need to read up. We need to pray. We need to wait. Uh, and God went quiet, you know, between Malachi and, and Matthew. God just bailed out and said, I'm going to ease off. I'm going to pull back. One of the great transformations in our marriage was the time we pulled back from being on each other's case saying, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. It's like <laughs> micromanaging. There's a time my wife told me, uh, I don't know whether you remember this, mm -hmm. but you, you expressed to me what it felt like to be Mrs. Cassidy Seruanga, this mm -hmm. surgical man. I, I'm a very surgical person. I am detailed and I am intense. And my wife told me, it feels like being operated. It's like, <laughs> like an operation where you're sliced open and, and then you're analyzed and, and I would slice my wife open and, and I want to be clinical and detailed and e exact and, and I would take her to pieces and she would sit there completely overwhelmed because that's not her, that's me and she doesn't know what in the world I'm fussing about and, and then she said, just as I'm recovering from the last operation, before, the, the, before the stitches are healed, <laughs> oh, my days, I'm back. And you are going yeah, with your knife again. And he said, I need to heal. I need, and that image struck my mind. And I, I began to realize I'm a very clinical, analytical person. 
And this is not a hospital ward. I think it's the difference mm. between, um, as women, we tend to operate a lot from the emotional side yes. of ourselves. Yeah. So um, when, when you're having one of those moments, and I know that we, we all have those times where there's not a lot of logic <laughs> in what you're going through. Sure. Um, but it's all, it's real mm. and it's, it's all emotional. And so yeah. you just pour out all this emotion um, on your husband and then they put on their thinking cap. Oh yeah. They put on your surgical gown. It very... Pull up the scalpel. You know, huh? like explain and what, and it's so technical. Yeah. And you're like, no, I, I actually don't point. need yeah. a four point sermon at the moment. <laughs> I just need you to say I understand. Preacher, pastor, <laughs> husband. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. yeah. It, I remember quarreling with, uh, arguing with you at the beginning. But we are believers. It must be the word. And I want to preach at you and show you the scriptures. And what you wanted was just compassion, empathy, and understanding. Yeah. I don't know that I've, I've graduated yet. Yeah. But at least when my brain comes back, I try to, to think, guys, the truth is this. Do you, did you know? that um, during high emotional times, your IQ drops significantly. When you're angry, <laughs> when you're upset, actually, we are at our worst when we are mad at each other because your intellectual quotient, your capacity to reason and rationalize drops significantly. That's why they talk about blind anger because your brain cannot process both ration and emotion in balance together. That's why grown-up men do weird things when they're upset. So guys, uh, your best foot forward is not during your conflict times. You need to learn how to back away, calm down, and work through things. But let's finish. Ephesians 5, love Christ, love as Christ loved the church. He came down from heaven, learned our language. Uh, the whole theme actually of marriage is redemption. It's redemption. And redemption works on grace. And grace means I see something in you and I decide to give you so much space and so much time and to embrace you and to celebrate you. You are in the process, yet to me it's a close deal. I belong here. This is my home. Whatever we do, we will do together. We'll work through. God has in grace declared us holy while he's cleaning us. He's, declaring, he's declared us healed while he's healing us. Uh, and we need to bring grace into our homes. And the theme has got to be redemption. Jesus came to redeem me. And the price was on him. He died for me. He bled for me. And that theme needs to come into our homes. That we are ready. I am ready to pay a price. I'm ready to be stretched out on a cross. Mocked uh, all around. I'm ready to be attacked but I'm dying for this thing. I will sweat for it. I will bleed for it because this is my earthly assignment in God that like Christ loved the church, Lincoln is going to love grace redemptively. I will fight for her. I will intercede for her. I will cover her. I will pay the price for her. I will die for her. That's the moment. And finally, the fourth stage actually is stonewalling when everything has failed. Everyone will build a wall of stones. This is where hearts become hardened mm -hmm. and people just disengage and don't want to know. This is when people make sure they avoid each other. If you're in the kitchen, I'm in the lounge. If you're in the lounge, I'm in the bedroom. Our conversations are dry and dead because bridges, when you fail to build bridges, you will build stone walls. Some way or other, you have to build something. Friends, the grace of God is available. We need to understand that the mission is about redemption. It's about paying the price for each each other. It's about the long haul. Thank God that He deals with us in the with the with the culture of grace. And as I say, and as we begin to wind this up, friends, remember. This thing did not stop start with us. It was not a human idea. It was never meant to be about a human social uh, uh, process. 
It was meant to be a reflection of a divine uh, story. And it's, it's scripted differently for every home. And like God, we need to understand that rules, regulations, which is the Old Testament, Old Covenant, don't do this, don't do that, <laughs> does not work. We cannot shout at each other and find intimacy. Rather, we need to pack our bags emotionally, spiritually, and move into each other's space and learn each other's language and build bridges. Be patient, be kind, be gracious, be sacrificial, and learn that these are skills. There are so many skills for us to learn. Again, the four horsemen, conflict, contempt, defensiveness, stonewalling. Stonewalling, as I said at the end, is when you shut down, you turn off, you turn everything down. You build walls. You build walls. Mm -hmm. You get busy, you avoid. And God forbid that in your first year, you're making that a culture, all in your early years. Um, they will pop up in different ways over the years, but we don't allow them to become culture. Otherwise, they will take the high ground. So in Jesus' name, we want to bless you. We want to say you are a winner. You can do this thing. We can do this thing. Let's put Jesus at the heart of it, and we will do well. Father, thank you that as we speak life into marriages in Chigali right now and across those that are networked here on this call, uh, Jesus is our model. And we thank you, Lord, as we see you stretched out on the cross, fighting for your bride. Um, and waiting for us and paying the price. We pray that we have such a mindset that redemption, sacrifice, self-sacrifice becomes the culture of what our homes look and feel like. We bless every home and speak life and resurrection to every situation that has been deathly. And we say no to the four horsemen. We ask that yes. instead of criticism, we will remember the good things that our spouses have. Instead of contempt, mm. we will have a sense of gratitude and thanksgiving mm. for each other. Instead of defensiveness, uh, we will uh, be able to, to pull down walls and allow ourselves to be vulnerable and approachable. And instead of stonewalling, we will build bridges in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Fantastic. Well, over to, um, to you, Alpha. I'm sure there are several questions in the house. Uh, we would love to see um, that we can answer back and, and um, share a little more specifically to the needs that are presented by those that are watching us online. Over to you, Alpha. We cannot find Alpha yet. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. Yeah, I kind of I liked um, when you were praying the mm -hmm. the the uh, replacements that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, the the replacing criticism with encouragement mm -hmm. and replacing. I, I I feel like God is all about exchange. Sure. And we need to learn how to what's the opposite mm -hmm. of what you're doing mm -hmm. so so with <clears throat> criticism it's easy because everybody's got a weakness you've got a weakness you who's criticizing have mm -hmm. a weakness mm -hmm. and we just need to learn um okay everybody's got a weakness but what are their strengths mm -hmm. so think exchange and think replacement i like that brilliant yes how far there you are I'm sure we have a few questions emerging from the conversation. Okay, let's try again. Okay, we're still um, looking off for Alpha. I think she's uh, just getting technically ready. Uh, please, yeah, yeah, guys, do. I think I should kick off the questions. Okay, you have. So what, what um, would you do? Mm -hmm. Because this is the assumption that both parties mm -hmm. are going to, to comply mm -hmm. with the word of God. Mm -hmm. But what do you do, say, if you, 
the wife mm. and you're not getting the, the person, the husband is not, is not following the Bible, his root, his <laughs> Christian. What's your role <laughs> when it's a one-sided? Yeah. Now, the, the truth, guys, is this, uh, that there's a difference between uh, religion and character. The Bible says the head of every man is Christ. I'm trying to remember where that is. Um, uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians 11, 3. The head of every man is Christ. It doesn't say the head of the born again man is Christ. The head of every man is Christ. Now what blows your mind is that there are a lot of Christ-like men outside of Jesus, outside of the church. They don't believe in Christ, but they have learned to connect and, and, and operate in Christ-likeness in values that are kingdom. I'm talking about um, patience. I'm talking about wisdom. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about that they are converted yet. The reality, friends, is whether we are saved or not, the only recipe for a successful marriage is Christ-likeness. And the difficulty is that, that in our world, no one is fully Christ-like, saved or not. The issue is when you choose to marry an unbeliever, if you choose to say, I'm going to marry someone who's not in Christ, you are embarking on a tough project. But sometimes even when you marry someone in Christ who is not committed to discipleship, you are embarking on a tough project. It's just one of those things. The reality is when the other partner withdraws their engagement, there is more pressure on you as the Christ-like partner, to give even more into this right. and to, to be that more patient, that more sacrificial, that more redeeming. The challenge is to understand laws, regulations, shouting is not redemptive. God tried it for however many books there are in the Old Testament. God sent prophets and there were threats and, and all this stuff. It did not work. A Christian spouse lecturing a non-Christian spouse is not necessarily redemptive. But it's when we make that journey, as I said, of entering each other's world, creating empathy, understanding, patience, self-sacrifice. These are the redeeming virtues of mm. any relationship. And uh, the, the tougher the sinner, the greater the grace. <laughs> <laughs> where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. I look at, at the patience that God brings and are prayerfully uh, coming into your relationship because let me tell you, friends, when you delegate the success of your marriage to your spouse, you are now dealing with a breakdown. I refuse to delegate the success of my marriage to my wife and say, when, if she's good enough, we will stay married. No, my, my determination is I am going to do this. I'm going to put in 1,000%. I'm not going to do 50-50. No, I'm doing 100. I hope she does 100 as well. That way we have a, a, a guarantee. When you say 50-50, if she withdraws her 50, the, 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 the covenant is broken. But I give 100%. And so when there's a deadlock and things are not moving, I will make decisions to compensate even for that deadlock on her side as much as I can, God helping me. Yeah, so that, that's, my, that's my answer to that question. Now, I don't know, yeah, there the air go. comes off. Yes. So thank you so much. Um, mm. I think we are not getting as many questions. Maybe people are still shy. So I will just shoot and try and imagine what questions people might have and then Hopefully that will open up for other questions. Sure. My, my first question is, a lot of us um, get married with the hope that we will change somebody or that they will change by themselves. Mm. Um, and my question to you is, what, uh, and there's some things that we know might not change, right? Uh, <laughs> so how do you 
what is worth white, what is worth really fighting for in terms of change and what should we make peace with? Uh, I was listening to a sermon last week, uh, a podcast, and apparently there's a statistic from a statistic from the Gottman Institute that says that two thirds of the problems we have will be managed all our lives and only a third can, that the problems we have, relationship problems in marriage and only a third uh, we're able to actually change and, and turn away from. And I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you to speak a little into that because a lot of times we are waiting on the other person to change yeah. um, or we think they're the ones that, mu that must change and the more you talk to people who've, who've been married for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, you realize that their personalities remain different and some of the things that kind of irritate them about their spouses have been there for 40 years, 30 years. <laughs> so how, how do you navigate that so that you still love one another and what's what, what are the mountains that people should die on and what are the ones that you know we should actively try to 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 change in our marriage so i'm not sure that's articulate enough it, but, is. Um, yeah. it, it, it hit me that uh, <laughs> i love, love the statistic right. from the bookman institute yes that 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 statistic hit me and i thought to myself oh my goodness are all are any of these fights worth fighting you know no. but um but maybe you speak into that and then I'll ask my second question. So hopefully by then everyone. Yeah, the bottom line is this. Change is a very difficult skill. Personal change is a very difficult skill. Most of the people walking our world have not mastered the process of personal change. I'm not even talking about changing for someone's sake. I'm talking about I want to change for my sake. How do I change? How do I break a habit? How do I change how I think? Change is not easy as a skill. So uh, we need to understand that. And the first evidence, again, going back to the underlying principle, discipleship is a change process. And thank God for the change master Christ that he has already come into us. Our best bet of transformation has got to first be evidenced in our ability to respond to his call for change for his sake. And I think he deserves the change more than my spouse does. And this is exactly why we need to understand that the first step for effectual change in our marriages is the acceptance of the call to discipleship. And so the couple must be committed to change for God's sake, beyond their own each other's sake. But also your marriage can become a catalyst that feeds your discipleship journey. And saying, oh my days, uh, because your wife, your husband will bring it to you, will bring your change issues to, to bear. Now, because I am so change inspired, I've always been challenged by the desire to change, to upgrade myself, to innovate myself. I, 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 when you are looking for a spouse, as you are going through courtship, you need to, instead of spending hours gazing into each other's eyes, you need to be engaging this reality. Does my friend enjoy change? Do they invest in change? Do they want to change? Because these are the things we should orientate before the marriage and invest into as cultures as we hit the trajectory of our relationship. We are a change-driven couple. We want to grow, we want to develop, we want to become. And, and in that process, Christ is the center and the catalyst of this. Uh, so these things need to be agreed as principles at the beginning. And it doesn't have to always be changed from you are like that and this I'm like that. No, it's a case of I want you to become the best of you that you can be. But like you say, indeed, the truth is that um, change does not necessarily happen because you need it. And uh, a friend of mine, one of our pastors uh, called Andrew, I love what he says. He said, you must marry on the grounds that your partner will not change at all. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, I often um, say this to um, courting couples. Well, when I speak to the ladies, mm. um, if there are, just think about the thing that really irritates you the most about this person. Mm. Can you live with it? Mm. Because you've got to face the fact that that might be something that will never change. Mm. Now, I'm not talking about um, in terms of discipleship as in um, things that we have to grow in as Christians, but there are things that, that irritate you that, that have nothing to do with actual Bible stuff. <laughs> Leaving shoes it's not, it's not in the, of the living spirit. room. Yeah, which is every man's Socks right, you know. on the chair. <laughs> Squeezing, squeezing the toothpaste in the middle. All those ah. things that, <laughs> that you kind of come armed. I'm going to change how this person does this A, B, C, D. You might never. Yeah. And many years later, you realize, actually, I met this person when they were 20 or something in their teens. They had all those foundational years in which they learned to do things in a certain way. <clears throat> and I think that it, it's maturity to accept mm. that certain things you're going to have to learn to live with them. Yeah. So there's, a, yeah. there's healthy boundaries where I must allow my wife to be a sovereign being. That's what makes her a worshiper. Uh, so worship can only be done by a sovereign being. So her choice to worship, her choice to love, her choice to sacrifice is essential to human definition. Now, she must use that choice. And this is where maturity comes in, that mature people make choices to do things for the other just because they love them. And so much as I say, um, I can't ch you can't change me. You can't change the other person. It rather should be the other way that we should be wanting to change ourselves. And we should be looking at my partner and saying, I'm going to do my best to make sure that I do things and I change uh, and, and I particularly making acceptance, giving, being accepting of other people's um, particular uh, ways. I think acceptance is a good word that mm -hmm. unless I am ready to give you acceptance in a particular area, I, am, I have no right to challenge you for change in that area. So my first step must be acceptance. Then change becomes licensed. That's how God deals with us, doesn't it? He accepts us as we are, yet he challenges us to change. And I believe that balance must be in the marriage. Yeah, I think that's our best alpha. Back to you. It's if a you really have good question. <laughs> so we have another question. Uh, it, and the question is, um, you're both very busy people and uh, you have a, a legal career, Pastor Grace. And we know that uh, running a church is like running 10 different organizations in one. Mm -hmm. um, you have children, you have extended family, um, and you have possibly other people that you support and you make time for to help them uh, grow uh, spiritually, financially, and in many other ways. So how do you balance all of this? Because I think part of what this pandemic has, has brought to front is even more demands on parents. Yeah. Um, because uh, when children are at school, Okay, we are, open, we are opening up now in, in, in Kigali, but when children are at school, um, we, the safeguarding is shifted off the parents from a good 7.45 to 3.30, yeah, if your child is a full-day student. Mm -hmm. And in the pandemic, um, now the, uh, the safeguarding is shifted back in a major way to the parents and even the, 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 the learning supervision. So they, 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 there was an added uh, responsibility that uh, I like to call pandemic parenting because <laughs> that in a pandemic, there, there, there are things you cannot outsource, right? Yeah. And of course, of course, coming from me, because I'm in the education uh, sector, 
Um, and I, we could see all the pressures that were on parents. They are already trying to help their organization survive the pandemic. They're already trying to survive the pandemic themselves. Um, problems that people could run away from and spend the whole day behind a, a laptop or, or hanging out with friends. Now, you couldn't, you had to be home. There's a time we had, uh, I think, seven o'clock, curfew, nine o'clock. So you really had to be home and face whatever was at home. And mm -hmm. now, in addition to that, you have to make sure that your child is learning. You have to make sure that they did their work. In fact, you have to reorganize your work day to, 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 to actually yes. instruct, to be there for the instruction. The younger the child is, the more present you have to be. So, and I know living in the UK that uh, you're, 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 you have a much more, you have less help than we have here. Mm. And so you're more hands-on. How do we balance this without losing our essence as a couple and our essence as, as Christians? And mm. how, how, how do you manage that balancing act without burning out? What are some of the tips Sure. And without uh, setting each other on fire with anger, or <laughs> <laughs> um, because stress stress tends to bring out the worst. Uh, Absolutely. In, in yeah. us, and this is a stressful time, and that unfortunately, in some situations, came on top of other stressful circumstances. So, how do you balance that um, so that you don't you don't lose? Um, the, the very things you, you, you treasure, like your, your marriage and your family or, or the relationship with your children. If I may spark on that, remember I, start, I said this at the very beginning uh, that this has been unfair. Uh, COVID has not been fair. No generation has gone through recently except the world wars. What we've just gone through is not common. It's not real. And so couples need to understand you would have felt the, the, the stress of this, the strain of this. You, you would have felt inadequate. You would have felt like I'm a bad parent. How come I can't do this? We are a bad marriage. How come we are fighting? You need to give yourself a little more grace. We've gone through um, the most exceptional time. We've never imagined homeschooling two kids. Uh, we stopped at two for that very reason. We thought if we had a, th had a third child to this mix of London, where you are cooking for yourself, cleaning for yourself, laundering for yourself, doing school runs, running a church, running a, we can't do, we can't meet every corner of our desires. We must stop somewhere. We wanted three, four kids if we could, but does it work? It doesn't. And so uh, th th that's point number one, but point number two, is, is also realizing that guys, it, you never balance this. The word is not balance. The word is rhythm. I think people have moved away from the word balance and understanding that we need to introduce a better word, which is rhythm. Uh, to be honest, in the real world, you struggle to find a balance. There are seasons where, uh, for example, an entrepreneuring come, uh, family, you're starting a business, try and be starting a business and uh, you have young children and a marriage, uh, you, you cannot think balance, you need to think rhythm. <laughs> so that when you're at work, you're at work, when you're at home, you're at home, find the time to really invest in quality time with your children, with your, with your wife. If you have to then sit up at night agreed that you're gonna put in three more hours at night while everybody is asleep, do it. But it doesn't always sit pretty and balanced, but it must have a sense of rhythm so that uh, you are not completely uh, out, of, out of structure and everything goes down like um, uh, a, a confused mess. I don't know what you would think. Yeah, um, can I just first of all say, um, big congratulations, kudos, well done to all the um, people that have young children in this time and have had to become teachers, 
parents, all of these things and work at the same time. Mm. I think you need to stop sometimes and pat yourself on the <laughs> back sure. and say, well done me <laughs> for having got through mm. three months, six months, seven months, whatever it is. Mm. Um, I think the key thing that you said there was seasons. Mm. So you have to think of life as seasons. Mm. I've, there's a time when I was in addition to um, being a lawyer, like working, I was doing university, I was pastoring, I, but it was a season. So it was um, a time when, when I, I had no spare time, but it helps when you, when you think, because when you feel like you, what overwhelms you is a feeling like it's never going to get better. Mm. or I'm stuck mm. in this thing. Mm. It's a season. And so in, in that season, you may be giving a little more time to books, mm. or you might be giving a little more time to the children. Um, and I think that it helps when you feel like, when you understand amongst yourself that we're going through a, a, a busy season, so mm. we might not have it all, all of the time that we have. Mm. That said, you need to remember your priorities. Sure. And so sometimes you have to be a bit more purposeful about having some time. We've never been great at date nights. And I know that some couples always have a date night in the week mm. and I salute them. We kind of haven't managed with the church and counseling and da -da -da -da, to always have date nights. But we do need to remember every so often, look, it's been a while. Yeah. We mm. need to take some time mm. for ourselves. Mm. So whatever rhythm works for you, you need to work find, find out a rhythm mm. that works for you rather than saying, now see how we failed. <laughs> the other couple there, they have they date do nights. <laughs> we don't have any date nights. <laughs> ah, end of the world. No, I, I think you need, we need to just chill a bit mm. and try and take each stage as it comes. People ask me, how do you manage to do all these things all at the same time? The truth is, sometimes I'm like, guys, I'm not going to be able to cook. Yeah because I have too much on. And so, so you, you kind of have to think, this is a season. I'm not going to try and be perfect mummy who cooks fantastic meals all the times while I'm doing a course. And, you know, so sometimes it doesn't work and they have to make do with pasta and whatever. Yeah. You know, and sometimes, like, sometimes I cook. Oh, I've said the, the big word. The reality, yes. friends, in a modern world, particularly for us here in the UK, you cannot simply uh, cordon areas off as I just don't do that. No, we do, we cross into each other's path. We are both career people. My wife works long, long hours. And some, some time ago, we had somebody supporting us at home, but they had to leave. So we, we, we take turns where we have to. I will enter the kitchen and I will create some incredible meals. Some of them uh, come out as burnt offerings, <laughs> but, but, but you know, we've got to participate together in life, cleaning the house, doing chores. So we need to overcome idealistic thinking and traditional mindsets, which says, I only do that, men only do the other. No, we need to be partners together in, in what we're doing so that um, uh, things become more bearable. I can see some questions posted here. I don't know whether you have others there. Yeah, questions are flooding in finally. <laughs> so I'll, be, I'll be quick. Yes. Um, allow me to, to just read. Uh, there's one here. When conflict becomes ultimately contempt and becomes unbearable, especially mm. if one partner has fallen from the faith, Mm. And the other is still a Christian um, or standing high in Christ is distancing an option. So the question is somewhat vague, but I think it's very I important can't, because, can't. 
Yeah. It also goes for people who might be in a relationship, a marriage where one person is not a believer and conflict is high. How, mm-hmm. and has moved to contempt, how, what advice do you have for them? The uh, second question is, is on, uh, there are two questions on parenting. A lot of conflict around parenting and parenting styles, particularly when children hit the teenage years and you realize that they're not, things are not going the way you had hoped. And one parent feels that the per- one is too harsh, the other is too lenient. How do you recon- reconcile parenting differences? Um, since, uh, it seems this is a, 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 a real root of conflict and possibly eventually con- uh, contempt. So yeah. you can tackle those two as others come in. Thank you. The parenting. I'll do the parenting. You want to go with the other one first? Mm-hmm. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, well, friends, this is the point. Is conflict is written through human history and the human experience. Yeah. Uh, this is the point that, as I said, we need to first of all understand we have partnership in God uh, as one who has de- been dealing with, his, with the conflict between himself and man. And God has never stopped. He just refused to stop from Genesis to Malachi. God is saying, let's try this. Let's send the prophet. Let's send the flood. Let's, he, so, well, he's God, so we, we can't must do all the things we could want to do. The reality is he is a non-ceasing pursuer. Uh, so he's not an undertaker. Uh, undertakers are those guys who look after funerals. They just want to put you uh, six foot under. God's commitment has always been to redeem, to save. And I believe that our assignment in Christ is to be redemptive. He is a redeemer. He is a savior. And I feel that my assignment as a pastor has always been redemption. I do not condemn. Uh, I mean, I'm invited to put somebody in the ground if they're dead, what can I do? But my contention and my calling is to fight for life. And so uh, whatever stage the relationship has got to, my, your assignment, I say as a believer, should be redemption. The point is when you don't have the tools to turn things around, that's where things become difficult. But I think that um, uh, uh, even when the relationship has gone to, to, to um, this defensiveness or contempt and stonewalling, there is still hope. There is still hope. The issue is you need to know uh, what not to do at that point. <laughs> and this is what I'm saying. That most people re- resort to lecturing or shouting louder or longer or nagging harder. These things do not redeem. Redemption is a journey of intercession, substitution. Mm -hmm. It is empathy, it is understanding, it is sacrifice. And again, all those things have a price to them. Uh, The covenant is for life, you seek to redeem. And, uh, but you need tools and you need mediation. Please seek help if you can. And uh, what I'm recommending now, because I find that men are hard to turn around in these situations. It's normally the wife looking for mediators. The men say, I don't want anybody in this marriage. (laughs) And so what we're recommending more is courses, online courses. And uh, even here at LCF, what we are doing is we are launching, I'm launching a marriage course. I'm calling it a marriage renewal course because it's easier for a couple now to get online together in their home other than drag your husband to a counselor or a pastor uh, for that matter. So uh, this may be a slightly more uh, approachable way that people are enrolled for an online course and there are all types now online. I am launching mine hopefully in in January. And uh, again, it's a case of style and content but people can study instead of looking for counseling. Uh, that's one tool that I would advise. When you feel you cannot get through, tell your spouse, can we seek help? Oh, I don't want to go to anybody. No, can we do an online course together? There are videos you can watch that will refresh your marriage. Uh, they are very resourceful people. People like Hassan, Pastor Hassan Chibiram, a very resourceful man in terms of pointing you to good resources. I'm sure the pastors at CLA may have other contacts. But uh, the point is that, that uh, uh, there are tools. I also want to recommend 
uh, the love letter, which can be a deadlock breaker. Love letter is a tool that was shared by John Gray. John Gray is a uh, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Uh, I think it's a beautiful way to, to try and communicate away from engaging directly with a person who may be stonewalling or defensive. If you, if you engage the love letter tool, and if you get online, you can see it. I'm sure you've heard of it before. Uh, it is all over the internet, but it's trying to move the relationship from the deadlock of anger and, and, and bitterness to other emotions which are underneath the surface and they may be easier to process. And so it starts by writing, as you're writing this love letter, it's a structured thing in which you talk about anger, I am angry, to sad, I am hurt, all I'm hurting, all I'm sad. And then you move to, I am afraid, all I'm worried. And then you move to, I regret and I am sorry. You can also move to, I understand. Uh, uh, it's a slightly safer way than these conflict engagements face to face, which trigger automatic behavior and people get stuck. They cannot move past a certain point. So they get into contempt. Please look for the love letter technique. It is online, John Gray, um, and other people talk about it. It may be one of the tools besides reading a good book together as husband and wife, or attending a course, which I recommend. Uh, uh, ours is called the Marriage Renewal Course. It's probably going to be in January. Uh, if anyone wants to jump onto that, we'll make it available. But look for other courses as well that may be in, in, in your, I know that LCLA has a packages as well. But please uh, don't fight alone over something you can't win alone. Yeah. Mm. Um, on just just to, to finish with that distancing option, um, I, I do recognize that there are some women or, or men who are dealing with a non-believing uh, partner. And I would just recommend what Paul recommended in Corinthians. Mm. I think it's 1 Corinthians, mm. where he says that where you've got a non-believing partner, you can win them by your conduct. Mm. Um, so... Um, I'm not saying that it's an easy task and, and, you know, pray all the way, pray all the way. Prayer is something that I super, super recommend. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're to win them by your conduct, you can't shut down shop because if you shut down shop, you can't have that influence with them. So though I understand the, what, the, the feeling of wanting to distance yourself and to move away, you can't be that far away that you can't influence them. Moving on to the issue with, with uh, children sure. mm. and disciplining of children, mm. I think that the number one thing that you need, you need to have a unified front. You need, I can't emphasize that enough. As a couple, you need to have a unified front when you're dealing with disciplining the children. Now, you may not completely have the same mindset. Usually in a couple, one is stricter than the other. Mm. And, mm. and different times in our lives, one of us has been the strict one. I think mm. it's mostly been me, <laughs> but sometimes it is, Lincoln is a bit stricter. But you need to, you can't say, leave my child <laughs> <laughs> or get things or yeah. communicate that with your eyes yeah they some, should not see yeah sometimes your <laughs> eyes are saying leave my child <laughs> um although you're not but it, it, this is your child together and they need to see that you have a united front yeah. through all their stages from yeah. infancy mm. through teens mm. to young mm. adults mm. your relationship together does a lot for them right. um, and your inf enforcing things together helps them yeah. so don't let them have sides you know don't do the good cop bad cop thing with your children it doesn't work for disciplining it just causes so confusion mm -hmm. in them so find a way to sit together away mm -hmm. from them and discuss the issue how shall we deal with that? Yeah. And so that when you are actually dealing with them, you are 
speaking as one. Mm. And if you haven't yet discussed it, just say, we need to discuss it. I need to discuss it with your dad. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes we've had to wait. So it's not a case of mom has had her turn of disciplining this child. And then like, wait for your dad when he comes. And then I also start from zero. It's better that we wait for each other so that we are not just overwhelming our children. And like, like, Pastor, like Grace said, we really need to present a front, one front. And we may not agree. But if we do not agree, one submits to the other. I sometimes say, okay, this one, I'm going to let you go. Let's, let's back your decision. And we will pre be united on that front. Although in my heart, I think you're being a bit lenient. <laughs> but, we've, but we've decided to do to do that together and, and present uh, one front. There was some, some talk about a teenage. Was there something about teenage? Um, um, no, I think that's... Did, did we answer that one, Alpha, or was there something more about teenage? I think I think it's I think it's uh, it covers the the two questions that we had. Sure. Um, essentially, it's about having a united front, right? Whether they are toddlers or teenagers, yeah. and um, uh, agreeing on on the plan that you have together. So sure. I think we've covered that. I'll move on to the next questions. Thank you so much for mentioning um, how it is we can seek help. Mm -hmm. and providing many options. And even if we don't get through the questions, um, mm -hmm. for those very hard topics, there are online courses, as Pastor Lincoln said. You can read a book together, and of course you can seek counseling. And uh, I think this, this, this is very insightful because uh, it, puts, it puts the ball back in our courts as couples to mm -hmm. actually be proactive about where we, we believe we need help. Um, the other question is about uh, loss of uh, employment. How, how do you handle the crisis when a man loses a job or a, or a business um, and the wife is working? Uh, the pressure that comes from limited finances, the pressure that comes from, uh, you know, a man who has lost uh, his his sense of purpose, his reason to leave the house every morning. Um, how do you navigate that uh, so that uh, you, you, you survive? And we know that as a result of COVID, a lot of people have lost uh, their employment. Uh, the other question, which is unrelated, is about in-laws. Uh, uh, apparently, uh, sometimes in-laws make it difficult for, for their children to build uh, a unit. Uh, for themselves, their marriage unit. Um, what about leaving and cleaving? Why does it only mention a father will leave? Um, why not, uh, sorry, uh, a man will leave his father and mother, why not a woman? Um, <laughs> but I think that the whole idea, I think, is how do you manage the in-law dynamic yeah. um, and, and, and make sure that it, 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 it adds to and doesn't take away from, uh, the, from, from, from your marriage. So we'll go with those two and then I'll, I'll ask others uh, thereafter. Thank mm. you. You're definitely doing the in-laws. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, great questions, guys. Uh, thank you so much. Um, if I can just deal with the financial pressures mm and loss of employment, it's all, <laughs> it's all around provision. It's all around the whole question of provision. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, this is something which, which um, I'm not, we're, not, we're not speaking out of um, theory. This is something that we faced. Mm -hmm. We've um, dealt with the whole giant mm -hmm. of provision, lack of provision, um, things not working out, unemployment, that whole place. Mm. And I really have to say that it goes back to faith. It is a faith question. Um, uh, financial pressures are real and it can be really difficult. But I found for myself, um, there was a time that when, before Lincoln was Pastor Lincoln, there was a life. <laughs> before he was Pastor Lincoln. And um, when we'd come to this country, there was lots of um, effort to try and, you know, you try to find 
where can I work? Can I build a career, mm. uh, employment? And the employment front, you know, at the beginning was very difficult mm. because um, it took it took him a while um, to sort of before navigating into ministry. He was doing. We first were doing cleaning together. Mm. Then I got a job at a, a, an admin job, um, and he was doing cleaning. And he was looking for work. So there was a period of unemployment and trying to settle. And, um, you know, it was easy for me in those times. I, I had to stop myself because sometimes I would come back and say, how are you doing? How is the job hunting? Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> how is the job are, hunting? Those were the first what years of, doing? of marriage. Well, have you read this paper? <laughs> Here's this paper. <laughs> Try this one. And then it became nagging because I'm worrying about is he going to has he done enough to get a job do I need to encourage him along the way and 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 it's kind of like hitting somebody when they're down mm. or yeah you can end up putting too much pressure on them and I had to grow up and step back and learn that we live by faith mm. we've got to trust God mm. to bring us out of this situation. Mm. We've got to trust the God that is in him mm. to lead him mm. to a job mm. and provide for our needs. Mm. And I had to stop being so anxious about the season. It mm. was a season. Mm. And we've been through seasons like that. We've been through seasons where he's employed, but all we get is a pay slip, not money. You know, the, check can, the church can give us a payslip, but it cannot pay us. Mm. And um, in those times, it's a time for us to remember that we do not actually trust in chariots or horses. We don't trust mm. in the payslip. We don't trust in the job. We trust in God. Mm. He's ultimately our provider. So it falls back on our faith. Yeah. And the, and the wife needs to understand how sore. This is for men. Men thrive out of the home. The center of gravity for a man is not the home. Weirdly, it is his palaces. The, the home is a woman's domain, the home. And when men do not have a, a career pursuit, an area of dominion outside of the home, they just feel so lost, so confused. And this is the time for you as the wife to lift up his hands yeah. and to affirm him and to send positive signals. Now, the truth is when you're in, in, a, in a negative economy like now where answers are no, and if they are the entrepreneur and capital has been blown, they are going to be disoriented and confused. And the last thing they want is nagging or questioning or attack or ridicule you really need to be careful because this season is passing perhaps, but one year of unemployment can blow. Uh, what would have been 60 years of marriage if you mismanage it? Just because you are impatient and going through the pressures, just know that this is central to masculine identity, is this sense of earthly assignment and a task or a career. So please, please, Understand, but also make sure that your understanding of headship is not, is not misdefined um, because some people say headship means you have all the money. Now that you have no job, you are no longer the head of this house. <laughs> I am now the head as the wife. And so what I say is what you do. You have completely mixed up, mixed up the principle because headship has got actually nothing to do with the fact that he earns more or brings the bacon home. Uh, we looked at that yesterday from the Proverbs 31 woman who is uh, running enterprise and the husband is in uh, level areas of governance and stewardship over the city. And there is no comparison there to say that he's earning more than her. Sometimes God supernaturally gives more grace to the woman to, to, to spear ahead, to go ahead and do stuff. And so be it. We are a team. We celebrate together. Your money is my money. My money is your money. So whether you're going through unemployment and I am 
Goy, I am employed and vice versa. We are each other's, um, um, uh, what do they call it? Cheerleaders. Cheerleaders. We support each other. We believe together. We walk together. So please watch out on those areas. But it's a tough time again. We say, guys, this is an unfair time. Either of you could have lost the job. So be gentle, be kind, and understand we do not worship mammon, mm. but we seek God and believe God. Lots of aff yeah. affirmation for periods like this. Mm. I remember that after um, I had the, the time that I, I was the one who was working and he wasn't working or was looking for job, things turned. Mm. Uh, uh, and there was another season, many years, a few years later, where for many years I was unemployed and I was now that it was on my side I was the one who was losing heart having done how many applications mm. I was the one in that place and I remember one of the things that pulled me through emotionally was when I was long-term unemployed my mom said to me that you can never fail you, something like that. You can never fail. <laughs> you will always find a job. And I said, what is she talking about? I've been <laughs> unemployed for years sure. or, or underemployed for mm. years. But that thing never left me that she always said to me, you can never fail. Mm. And that's something I say to Lincoln a lot. Mm. Whatever you put your mind to, it will work. Mm. You can never fail. You're mm. great. Mm. And everybody needs somebody to be saying, that into their lives. Amen. Okay, Amen. quickly, time. In yes, those. in those, yes. <laughs> Why does a God say man should um, leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife? Let's just remember the context of Jewish households was that uh, the children will stay at home. Basically, the homestead is extended. So the new couple join the husband's homestead. So Abraham's tent would have had three, four generations, you know? That is how it typically was done. So it was possible to have, uh, without knowing, a, an extension of the patriarch's headship leading all the homes. And so although you have started your own home, you are connected to daddy's home, who's connected to grandfather's home. Mm. And so, uh, so the, the scripture is clear here that the sense is uh, the, with a strong patriarchal society and generational covering, it is important that although we rem the, the woman now joins your identity as the man, you should sever. There should be a clear severance from your paternal oversight to become a head over your own home. I think that's why there's that emphasis that there can be a tendency for the, so the God is sent away to get married to this home, which is an extension of different headships. So uh, the need for me to sever my, 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 my link with my paternity as a man so that I can create my own lineage with my wife is, is what I feel the emphasis is there. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's the wife who needs to sever. The issue is like you're saying, it's the, the process, the influence of in-laws uh, and, and the need for a couple to be given space to create a culture which is their own because usually there is, there is a need to challenge some of the behavior of where you're coming from so as to fit effectively into your new home. Mm -hmm. And so boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. And I had to speak to my own family and tell them now I am a husband and my first priority is my wife, not the family. Now the difficulty is the richer the family is, the, the more difficult these uh, in-law issues become because there's heritages and traditions and richer families normally have a lot a stronger patriarchal cover and people go home for Christmas, people go home for Easter and now you, you're married and you have to do the the pilgrimage to, to your father's mm -hmm. gathering. <laughs> and then the mother comes to inspect the house to see whether the wife is cooking well. And uh, when is the next baby coming? And, and things can be over monitored by in-laws and in-laws need to back off and give a healthy distance. 
And we as families, the husband and the wife need to turn inward, not to sever all relationship, but to create a clear boundary so that this home has its own sovereignty and it is not annexed to a strong patriarchal figure that is your dad or your mom or matriarchal figure for that matter, because that space is needed for this couple to breathe and to resolve their own conflicts. So the last thing you want is to take your conflicts to your in-laws and to inform them and to become accountable to them. Uh, the, I think it's a difficult one to manage one side, but I think a good parent steps back healthily and allows their children to step out and build another home. And I think it's important that you listen to each other on this. Mm -hmm. So if um, you're feeling stifled by the in-laws, mm -hmm. you should be able to discuss it <laughs> and back each other mm. on it rather mm. than back your the family that you you left effectively. Mm. So I, I think um, I, I really appreciated mm. the times when Lincoln has backed me where I've not, I mean, we're, we're two different, we're different cultures. I'm a Munyaranda, he's a Muganda. I do some things which are not Baganda proper. <laughs> um, so it's, but he's backed me. Mm. I, like, you know, like even small things like we don't kneel um, and they kneel. And he's, he's, he said, no, 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 it's not, you know, kneeling is not, don't kneel. <laughs> so he said, he's had to, he's backed me on that above his culture mm. so in a, in a sense you you as the make your your culture as you as a family mm -hmm. and support that above the culture of your extended family yeah but obviously when my wife would visit my mother she would knew yeah but ceremonially on our wedding day she, there, there are some scenarios i asked him do i <laughs> <laughs> what do i do and he said, eh. <laughs> so yeah yeah, I, I hope that is fairly sufficient. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the other question, just a second. Two questions once again. The first mm -hmm. question is, you've talked about rhythm, seasons, and uh, not really focusing on balancing, but looking at the rhythm and the seasons. Mm. How do you raise your children so that they can learn to take on those rhythms in order to have healthy marriages? And second question, what do you do when you feel like your love life starts perishing? Dot, dot, like the vibe you started within year one isn't there anymore, and this includes intimacy. Mm. Um, and I think, again, when it comes to intimacy, uh, in times of crisis, even crisis before COVID, it's not like COVID is the first crisis to hit our marriages, yeah. um, uh, you find that the couple is emotionally and physically distanced. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it might, it might, maybe people are social distancing due to COVID, but one meter, one meter distance in the bedroom. So <laughs> how can you speak into that and, and advise how do people come back to that place of intimacy if there's been a gap caused by anything, stress? conflict and this particular person says he's he or she is comparing to year one and now how do people uh, arrive at a point where it's like oh my goodness we are so far from what we were in year one yeah. um, and how do you plot your way back um, I think those are the two questions that I've asked and we can continue thereafter thank you all right um, I'm, I'm conscious of the time you're going to be the the I'm a social distancing person. <laughs> um, children, I think children learn a lot from how, what we do. Um, mm. they, they learn more from what we do than what we say. So, so we may say a whole lot of things, but they learn balance, they learn security, they learn all of these things, how to deal with life 
So if if they've watched us, I, I found that it's been important for us to share with them our testimonies of how we've dealt with hard times and how God has provided and all of that. It builds their faith. They learn. They learn from the testimony of our lives. So though we cannot form them out of our, after our own image, our stewardship is basically to testify to them in our lives and through our lives um, how to deal with different things. So, so they learn. You know, like I learned from my mom things that she's not, she's said, but she's done. She's so demonstrated. It's, demo, it's what she's demonstrated. Mm. So I, I think that my work ethic, all of us as, a, as ch her children have picked up a work ethic from her because that's how she works. She works flat out mm. and we've all picked it up. She, mm. you know, she said it, but more, more so she's demonstrated it. Mm. So life throws, you know, like there's different seasons, there's hard times, there's good times, all of that. And how we handle them is important for us and our well-being, but it's also important for the children's well-being so that they can see that, you know, hard times come, but we can have fun in hard times and we can nav navigate that and we can go to the next season. Mm -hmm. So they learn. So you do it right mm -hmm. and what you do will reflect on the children. Sure. sure. Yeah, okay. Intimacy. Now, I, ins I sense that intimacy there was a reference to actual physical intimacy as well. Yeah, the whole package. Uh, the, the basic thing, guys, is this, is that uh, most marriages are not fulfilled in the bedroom. There is a, 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 an elephant in the room that uh, typically, as you say, stage one of the relationship is passion stage, and that's the giveaway word, passion. And that passion um, is there, there, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Of the five love languages, only three are intimate. The others are very social distanced. Gifts and presents <laughs> mm, and works of service. I can clean the house. I can buy you flowers, but I need the other three. I need physical touch. I need words of affirmation. Hmm? What's the other one I've left out? Um, I've, I've got a blank. Uh, the, the third. Physical touch, quality time, yeah, yeah. words of affirmation. Physical touch, words of affirmation, quality time. Those three are at the heart of intimacy and pre, 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 uh, continuing on intimacy. Now, from one, from day one, my wife and I have always decided we are going to be together in the same space, doing the same thing, at least every day. So we try to watch a program together. We are together in the same space, enjoying the same thing. I'm not watching football while she's watching something else. We come together. In the first years of our marriage, most almost five and 10 years, we will always end the day together, enter the bathroom together. She's in the shower, I'm at the sink. We are talking. She starts a song in, uh, in key, uh, key D, I harmonize. We, we are together. And the difficulty with, with, with intimacy is it must have a geographical expression. You cannot be one when you go to bed at different times, watch different products, eat at different times, you go that way, I have my friends, you have your friends. No, we need to do together. Also, we celebrate every anniversary together, every birthday together, every wedding anniversary. We do things together, yeah? Now, this is so important and finding those quality times, those moments together is so, so important. Now. Moving there, finding out what is my intimate love language with my, with my spouse? Do we have any? Some spouses do not, some couples have no intimate love language. They don't do quality time. They don't do physical touch. They don't do words. Then what is it? What is it that you do? <laughs> what is it that you do? We need to be able to do quality time together. I'm touch. I am touch. 
my heart is in my hands. And, <laughs> and you, my wife is not as touchy as I am. I am way worse, but I will do it whether she permits it or not. I will touch, I will reach out to her at the most awkward time. I will lay my hand on her. I will touch her. And that's a signal from me. I see you, I feel you, I value it. The other thing is seeking to go to bed together as much as well when I'm a, a late nighter. Sometimes I go to bed when I'm grumbling. I want to stay up and do something, but I will still go up with her. I will, we will enter the bed together. I will hear her beginning to, to breathe as she's asleep. Then I'm up and I'm doing stuff in bed alongside her. At least, at least, at least. Yeah. And the other thing, friends, is the, is the elephant in the room is most women do not value a sexual union as they should. Let me say it as it is. From many years of counseling, most women say sex is overrated. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality, guys, for men, sex is one of the most important things that ever happens to them in connecting with themselves and their loving side and in expressing it to you. You may say, what's the big deal? I cook. I look after the kids. No, 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 no. After all that, there is a way that I renew my love towards you and my passion towards you when I can celebrate you and us in a physical union. And women need to upgrade the importance of sexual union because the difficulty with women, especially when children come in, the house becomes an administrative space. Dishes, sheet, bed sheets, clothes, food, cleaning, and they enter an administrative space. Whereas men, when they come home, do not become administrative. And so they are more available to passion and, and intrigue and adventure. Women are too administrative. So they always feel, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. And uh, I want to say that our 31 year marriage, hmm, has still preserved a sense of sexual buzz and chemistry. And it has to be stewarded in, in together in, first of all, making sure you do not surrender to the death spiral of what the less intimacy you have, the less intimacy you will need. The less sexual satisfaction there is in the marriage, the less sexual pursuit there will be. And so the couple need to understand that this is not a joke. Like you need praise and worship in church. You need sex in marriage. <laughs> I, <laughs> that's me using a very radical de definition. Yes, I love you. But on this particular moment, I write songs for you. I set a key and we crescendo and we break through in the spirit and we touch something. And now we can sit and hear a sermon. But we, we've been somewhere together. <laughs> And we've been touched somehow. And so, guys, it is not a joke. But you see, I could be on this all day. And the truth is, guys get tired of chasing and asking and begging. They then collapse from the passion and become, okay, it's administration here. So his heart then turns to business and to his hobbies and to his friends. And the core of the relationship collapses. Um, I, I, I don't know what I've said and I've not said, but guys, uh, can I say, guys, when I say guys, I need to appeal to ladies from my counseling experiences. Guys want you to take sex more seriously. And women, you need to know if you do not think and envisage sex, it will die in your subconscious. You will lose interest because you are too administrative. And I think you need to know when to switch off admin and switch on the charm and reconnect with your womanhood and look after yourself and, and plan with your husband. Because one of the th thoughts in his mind is, is you, but you are thinking plates and pans and children and clothes and lights and bills. And you need to know when to stop and turn your heart to the lover that you met in those first years and be a woman for him before midnight, preferably, <laughs> so that you are in touch with your own sexuality and it is not banging at the door, 
helplessly hoping to be admitted, and you are inside, <laughs> sleeping in your own house, in your own brain, because you have become too administrative. I've said it all. Yeah, I, think. I hope I'll you try. can see it. <laughs> you open the can of words. <laughs> Yeah, but I think in conclusion, mm -hmm. there's so much to say, but I think in conclusion, it's about doing to one another what you would like somebody to do for you. So if something's important to the other party, you need to make it important to you. I mm. think that, that's, that that keeps things well oiled. Yeah, Alpha, here, at, here in the Seranga household, the temperature is high. <laughs> um, we are in now. We are. We are still very young. But I am head. I. She is twenty five. I'm heading towards sixty. <laughs> <laughs> thank. In fact, thank you so much. The next question is related. Somebody wrote that there's a, a pandemic in some of our homes. Uh -huh. uh, that couples are choosing to to have separate bedrooms, uh, um, saying, uh, we're, you know, we're no longer fulfilling each other's needs. Um, <laughs> let's, let's just have a strategic partnership for the sake of the children. Oh, dear Lord. Um, and uh, it, it's it's as you, you you can see that I'm sure there there are a lot of uh, underlying issues there, but apparently. Uh, this is something that uh, someone would like you to speak into. What happens? Where do you start when you find yourself in a situation where the social distancing has become uh, two separate bedrooms? And yeah, you yeah. can speak it. I know, I know it's a hard one, but uh, we trust you. Good luck. But that's almost become aggressive when it's like, I, I just don't want to raise my hopes. Let me just go elsewhere so that I know this is the policy. Uh, the reality is this, uh, in a way, in, in dealing with the sexuality, women are frustrated by men who do not know how to romance them and engage the reality of their own sexuality. Female sexuality is subservient. It's, it goes into the background. It needs to be teased out uh, through thoughtful engagement and romanticizing. And sometimes guys uh, can become negligent of this. And uh, guys, uh, tradition is a killer. The Bible says the traditions of men make the word of God of no yeah. effect. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we are too traditional in our approach. We need to be exploratory. We need to be adventurous. Our, our sexual life must be created. Can you imagine if every worship session had the same songs every Sunday on, in the same key? Uh, and this whole lack of creativity and adventure is what kills these intimate times because you are just not taking time to think and work together. And so despair, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And uh, couples, Guys, those that are getting married, this is an area to invest in. And um, we need to make sure we're not taking tradition into our homes. Now, I just don't think I, we can go deep enough here online with the time that we have left. But I feel that this is an area that we, you need to invest in and, and ensure that you, you are not autopiloting, which is what we tend to do about a lot of stuff. But guys, that pandemic must be killed. It's, it's worse than Corona. If mm -hmm. a family, if a husband and wife uh, no longer expect delight from each other. Um, I mean, I married a fairly conservative girl. This girl had actually decided she doesn't even wanna get married. She was so busy chasing after Jesus until she found me chasing after her. And we are as sexual as we are spiritual. To, for us, the two are in parallel. In fact, the more anointed I feel, the more I need her. Yeah? It's, it's got to be a balance. It's, it's a reality of the celebration of who we are. And it, it is not a joke. 
It is not a joke. And so we need to deal with whatever the demons are and whatever the tragedies are that we may have gone through that switched us off in the first place or the traditions that have made it dead and boring. When women do not expect, do you know, weirdly, that up to 70% uh, females do not actually experience a rewarding sexual, sexual experience in the natural copulation process that a husband and wife has. Men, two seconds are in happiness. Women need a little more strategy and understanding and sensitivity. And so my pursuit as a husband is to ensure I am not running off with the trophy and she's saying, I didn't even hear the whistle. Did we even start this game? And you are off with the trophy saying, yeah, no, you played alone in your own corner. You scored your own goals in your own goal and no one else was blessed in this process. And so my attention to her delight is what ensures that I will be delighted again tomorrow. It's a devotion you must have mm -hmm. and you must commit to it I am not in here to benefit, I'm here to give and to understand how is this girl made and how do I ensure that she will be thinking about me the rest of her life because we not only talk and connect and share time, but we also both always enjoy the highest pleasure together other than me running off with the trophy. I've used a lot of picture language because um, I could go so deep, but I get, I get deeper with one-on-ones. But yeah. guys, yeah. If yeah. I can just, with closing words, just implore those couples that have come to this place, mm -hmm. that God is a God of restor restoration yeah. and he can repair the damage. Mm -hmm. You, I don't think anybody goes lightly into mm -hmm. another bedroom, mm -hmm. but it's not a solution. I grew up in a home where this was happening. And as children, it has an impact on you to see your parents living separately in the same house. Mm -hmm. It isn't what God wants for you. It's not what you want for each other. It's not what the children want. So their underlying issues and what we're trying to communicate <clears throat> is that these things are not things that have not happened to anyone else. They are common. There's nothing that you go through that someone else has not gone through. There are answers. Let us seek God. Go back to the drawing board mm. and find the answers mm. so that you can come back to where you're supposed to be. You're not supposed to be strangers living under one roof. Amen. One roof. Amen. Mm. Um, I think... I just have one quick one. We've talked a lot uh, in general, but um, what do we, uh, what can we say to couples that are dealing with, uh, I would say very critical issues at this point, let's say they are tuned in, um, considering uh, infidelity, um, depression, addictions, and uh, where, do, where would such a couple, or if one spouse is watching, um, and I'm sure there are other issues that are of that nature that could lead someone to another room, or maybe not just another room, even out of the house, yeah. um, depending on the severity of the issue. Um, uh, maybe violence, I don't know, but uh, I'm sure in your experience, there are those kinds of issues that are quite uh, um, critical and maybe you would speak into those and then that will be the very, very, very last question. Um, I think we need to remember that much as we have a God that loves us, we do have an enemy that hates us. Mm. And um, we perhaps <clears throat> have not spoken enough about the spiritual aspects and mm. the fact that we do need to guard ourselves in prayer and to pray over things. Now, I'm, I was one of those people that grew up with the feeling that if, if my husband ever is unfaithful to me, end of, you know, like I'm not even going to discuss that. For me, that's a no-go area. Um, and we've pastored people where the family has fallen into disrepair 
and one one of the couples has been unfaithful and for me i used to think that's that's the end that's the end of the game it can't be but i've watched people that i can only call mighty women of god who have prayed back mm. spouses mm. who have prayed back marriages from death mm. and they have been restored mm. so never say never is what i i now go by I believe in the power of prayer. Mm. Whether you're dealing, I've seen people pray their husbands through addictions where I would have just folded up my hands. I've seen them pray their husbands back who have been unfaithful and somehow God has restored. In, in the case of one couple, the person who had strayed has even become a pastor and <laughs> is that restored to <laughs> God. So I just wanted to plug in the mm. spiritual that let us remember that we come against, um, we are dealing with an enemy who's real mm. and he, he's fighting, yeah. but greater is he that is in us than the devil that is in the world. Mm. Are there situations where marriage, you might need a break? I would say that if there's physical violence, we need to talk about that because I, I don't think I would tell you to stay in a house where you're being pummeled to death, you know, mm -hmm. um, but you can be separate for a while and pray and maybe God can con convert that person. Never say never. But yes, there are mm -hmm. situations like that, mm -hmm. which perhaps will be another discussion for another time. Sure. Yeah, for me, the answer is think redemption. The whole thing goes back to the fact whatever scenario you are in, think redemption. Think back and consider that somehow in the sovereignty of God, wherever you've ended up, God still has a reach into that situation. Imagine you are writing your own epistle. Your marriage is part of an epistle being written by God. What does it read like? Where is it going? Are you willing to believe God for his redemptive purpose to still work through the pain that you're going through and the difficulty and uncertainty that you're facing? Are you going to write yourself into this story definitively and say, okay, I want to see redemption in this situation? Please consider the other word, mediation. Yeah? Mediation with where, that's, where both of you elect, and this is the point, that sometimes you are trying to drag a mediator in and your spouse does not want them. Can you consider someone both of you will listen to, yeah, uh, to engage? Uh, but in mediation, I would also add education. And education sometimes is a safer platform where particularly for men, my history, my experience has been the wife wants counseling, the husband does not, because the counselor is usually another man. And men are intimidated by other men speaking about their own failures, so they don't want to go. So thank God for online technology. We now have an opportunity to passively engage or to engage at a distance, because when you watch a video, at least you're still as a man feeling, yeah, I'm still not, at least I'm not under that man. They are, they are safe enough to watch and follow through a discussion. And if it's uh, has got interactive elements as most of these things are doing, there is a better chance through education going ahead of mediation. So when the man bonds with the teacher, at least, he may then consider a session with that person, but it's a safer distance. But sometimes friends, you are trying so much on your own to resolve a situation that has outgrown your own skill set and you need the intervention of somebody else. Mm. So that's my recommendation. Gently, redemptively, do seek for intervention. If you're part of this, get online and find help. And let me say this as well. You have got to put money into this and time because either way you will pay if things go so bad there is bills everywhere. So I would rather invest in redemption than invest in cremation uh, <laughs> and, 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 and com 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 commission in, into the grave. I would rather, friends, you set aside a budget 
and pursue intervention so that we can see turnarounds in our homes. Amen. That's my suggestion. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor, Pastor Lincoln and Pastor Grace. I think you leave us uh, with a, a, a list of things that are going to push us to, to the next level. Um, you're calling us to a higher level of engagement and intimacy, and also um, taking responsibility for the change that we want to see. Um, I would like to thank everyone who has tuned in today. The YouTube video will be, um, I'm wondering if there'll be some edits, but it's going to be on, 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 the, on the CLA channel. So do continue to share the link and uh, to, to have these discussions. I would encourage every couple to take time to digest, reflect, and make a, a few action steps, even just two. Um, it's very easy to attend a seminar, get excited, and, and then um, come Monday, everything is back to normal. So I'd say not later than today or tomorrow, have a very rich discussion with, with, with your family, with your spouse or um, other couples, and just come up with a personal action plan that, uh, that addresses some of the things that are pertinent to you, but that were raised here. Um, I think now, Pastor Lincoln, Pastor Grace, please pray for us. And I'll hand over back to you to, to, <laughs> to bless us. And, and, and then we can call it uh, uh, okay. a, a morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I wanted to also actually point to, I sent a few of these books to CLA. My first book mm -hmm. is, is, a, is an exploration of seven key areas because a marriage is one of the areas of destiny for us. And uh, for those of you that may be exploring, some of people may be here as pre-courtship couples, what are the keys that lead me to my destiny? Uh, some of the answers here actually answers to the whole question of marriage that we've been looking at. Seven key areas, if I may just go through them quickly as titles. Um, and I talk about key gifts, talk about key people, I talk about key battles, talk about key insights, I talk about um, key choices, and uh, very highly illustrated with stories, the story of this lady and how I met her, and um, knowing key people, how do you define them, how do you find key moments that define your life, uh, fighting those key battles, this may feed into the journey as well for marriage. Uh, there are about 150 of these that I've sent over to CLA. Uh, Pastor Hassan, Pastor Amos will, will help you guys connect with those with those um, resources. Just thought I'll plug that in here. Yeah. We want to pray and bless mm -hmm. these um, couples up there. In Jesus' name. Okay. Father, in Jesus' name, we, we just reach across uh, the... Um, distance right here that we may have geographically and just connect to your timeless presence. And we pray into every home that is tuned into this broadcast and pray in Jesus' name for mm -hmm. redemption. God of redemption. God who brings back the dead uh, to life. God who resuscitates the dying. God who raises the dead and calls things that are not as though they are God of excellence, we pray that you visit our homes. Mm -hmm. And we pray right now for miracles to happen in homes where the last breath seems to be two minutes away. Mm -hmm. That somehow through the words that have been spoken and the impartation spirit to spirit that has happened here, there will be new beginnings for couples. There will be breakthroughs for those that have been feeling overwhelmed uh, for those that have been caught up in, in, in cycles of conflict, for those that have been overwhelmed by uh, co 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 contempt, those that have been stonewalling and cut off, that through the tools shared and the opportunities to connect with resources beyond themselves, you would uh, touch our homes and our marriages and turn them into havens of beauty and glory for your name. We, we, we do say, Father, we are sorry. We repent and regret ways that we may have treated our spouses and, and ourselves in ways that have just destroyed 
uh, some of the joy we could, have in, we could have had. And we ask, Lord, that you grant us fresh vision, fresh adventure and passion to go forth and be all that we can be to each other, to our churches, our communities, our children, and beyond for your glory. Thank you again, Lord, for every marriage in CLA, those that are and those that are about to be. We bless them and release them into your mighty, mighty provision and grace and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen and amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you, Alpha. Thank you, CLA. Thank you. Thank you, CLA. Have a good weekend. Let's see.